Yes? Okay, good. Um, I also want to thank the organizers for including me in this very historic meeting. Uh, the other day I was texting somebody, and after I clicked send, I noticed that my name was autocorrected to Fossil. <laughs> so I think it is very appropriate in view of this meeting, uh, although, you know, still very sobering. But it's wonderful to see so many familiar uh, faces and also especially my previous co-workers, uh, Bob, Beatrice, Vefa, and hopefully George later on. Um, when I first went to NIH in the early 1970s, uh, retroviruses were all the rage, not as human pathogens at that time, but as important tools in molecular biology and also as uh, animal mod in animal models for the study of oncogenesis. I think very few scientists at the time, as you've heard, uh, even believed that human retroviruses existed. So being from Bob's lab, we were clearly in the minority. Cold Spring Harbor uh, has always held an important place in our research career. Uh, is sort of the mecca for retrovirologists. Uh, they have this annual uh, RNA tumor virus meeting that you've heard about, which I attended every year. I remember the meeting was held in May, right before the Memorial Day weekend every year. And um, when the human um, retroviruses session finally was established, it was always on the last day, right when people were ready to take off for the long weekend. So mostly it's just the uh, presenters and a few stragglers that were left. But of course, things uh, change rapidly right after uh, HTLV-1. So my uh, assigned topic for today is the uh, discovery of HIV transactivated genes. But I would also like to take a few minutes to talk about a um, current project that I'm quite excited about, uh, which is related to cure research. So that would be my contribution for the history and the future of uh, HIV AIDS research. So, I mean, you've seen this slide many times. The simple retroviruses are, of course, very simple. Uh, expression of all the viral proteins uh, uh, is regulated strictly by host cellular factors interacting with cis-acting viral elements. The first glimpse we had of a complex human retrovirus was when Yoshida sequenced the HTLV-1 genome and noticed there was a three prime open reading frame, which he termed X. Subsequently, I think Joe Sodrowski uh, showed that the uh, LTR-linked cat expression was much enhanced in virus-infected cells, suggesting the presence of uh, a, trans a viral encoded transactivator. And later, um, a number of groups show that that activity can be attributed to a sequence or a gene uh, in, in this uh, law, uh, X, in, in this PX region. But of course, the complexity increases uh, from, you know, from that. When we come around to the uh, HIVs, you see that the viruses have a lot more bells and whistles. Now, I know my perspective on the early events surrounding the discovery of the um, HIV regulatory genes is naturally focused through the filter, filter of the work from our own group. My, I was very blessed at NIH with a a uh, team of very talented and hardworking young scientists from all over the world, from Italy, Germany, England, Scotland, India, Iran, you know, whatever. I think Bob was a world traveler, and instead of collecting souvenirs, he collected postdocs. Um, so, but I felt very much at home, being a foreigner myself. But. I cannot emphasize enough that there were a lot of contributors to this uh, early molecular dissection of HIV. Many labs were active. After all, we were confronted with 
an enormously complex new virus, which is responsible for a devastating global uh, pandemic. So I think you know, we had a lot of motivation to do as much as we can, as fast as we can. And um, in, in fact, I think in the four years, the first four years, I would say from 1984 to 1988, it's a period of intense, hectic activity and intense competition. I mean, there was a lot of uh, collaboration as well between groups, but there was also a lot of uh, competition. Now, a number of key studies early on provided the essential tools to actually decipher the HIV genomes. So, con oh, no, I should uh, continue with that. I think the, one of the fallout of um, independent, simultaneous uh, discoveries is that everyone gives their own discovery a different name. I think you heard about the naming, you know, disagreement of the virus. I think it's a lot worse for the molecular biology because there were so many genes and everybody has their own pet name for the genes. And here is when Cold Spring Harbor intervened again. There was a meeting set up to have all the um, uh, uh, active players involved to meet and discuss the total data at that time and to try to reach a consensus for the names used. They wanted a chairman who is respected, obviously, but also impartial, and Harold Obama stepped into that role. So um, from this meeting, we decided uh, on a list of names for the various genes. And after the meeting, with buy-in also from Montagnier and from Yoshida, so we have, you know, across the Pacific and across the Atlantic agreement, uh, so we finally settled on this uh, list of names and communicated that to nature. And uh, so finally, we had an agreement, at least for the names of the genes. So just continuing on the uh, a vein of competition, um, the first key study that we did was the cloning of the virus. And Beatrice, uh, George, and uh, Sasha Aria were instrumental in this work. But you see that we published this work in Nature in November 1984. And then a month later, um, Mark Ellison in, uh, in Montagnier's lab uh, uh, reported their cloning, or the cloning of their virus. And this theme continues when you look at the, uh, the next milestone, which is the sequence of the complete genome. Uh, here we, uh, published in January of 1985 in Nature, the complete nucleotide sequence of actually two, in, two clones from, uh, from a, uh, a virus. And uh, Mark Ellison and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Wayne, uh, Wayne Hobson, Simon Wayne Hobson, published their data in Cell also in January 1985. Now, it's not just the scientists who are com competing, the journals are also competing. Because we, you know, the dates are so close, I, just out of curiosity, I look at the submission date of the papers. And you see that our paper was submitted uh, November 29th and accepted December 14th, while for the cell paper from uh, uh, Wayne Hobson, they were submitted December 26th and there was no acceptance date, so I guess they was, it was accepted immediately. So I think uh, for some reason, uh, Cell probably found out about a paper and they didn't want to lose out to nature. Now another key finding that we had was the obtaining of a molecular uh, clone with biological activity, and this was work mainly done by uh, Mandy Fisher. Uh, this clone, uh, HXB2, was able to not only infect T cells, but it's also highly cytopathic for it. So I agree with what uh, Ron de Rosier uh, said last night. It is immensely useful to have a biolo biologically active clone because now you can introduce any mutation in the coding sequence or even non-coding sequence and determine its relevance 
uh, not only in infection, but in its uh, cytopathicity. And we've certainly utilized this uh, clone extensively. And others as well, I should say. Now, the nucleotide sequence revealed several open reading frames in addition to GAPO and ENV. And one can ask the question whether those are real genes or just, you know, aberrant open reading frames by looking at peptides derived from, from, from them and see if they are recognized by patient sera. And use, using this kind of approach, four uh, genes can be uh, identified, the VIF gene, the VPR gene, uh, the VPU for HIV, uh, HIV-1, and, and NEF. And then if one asks the questions, are these genes really important for virus infectivity by introducing uh, mutations in the uh, uh, infectious clone? Uh, surprisingly, they were not. So that's why they were dubbed accessory genes rather than uh, essential genes. Uh, and, uh, but that doesn't mean, of course, that they, are, they don't contribute to virus infectivity or cytopathicity. In fact, uh, Mandy Fisher had shown that uh, defects in the VIF gene greatly compromise the virus in its transmiss transmissibility and in in infectivity. And I think later on you'll hear the wonderful story about uh, how VIF can disable a host defense mechanism. Uh, I think um, Mike, yeah, Mike, uh, no. My, uh, Mike Malum, right? Mike Malum is going to present that. Now, interestingly, the essential genes TAT and REV actually were not reviewed by the uh, nucleotide sequence, and that's because the coding sequences were discontiguous. So they were brought together by splicing events, uh, and they were not immediately obvious from the, from the uh, se sequence information. So Sasha Aria uh, in the group, uh, looked at functional cDNA clones and uh, looked at uh, the ability to uh, transactivate the, um, the uh, LTR-linked cat genes. Now, in fact, I should mention that, again, Sodrowski was the first to show that there was a transactivator protein encoded by HIV because, as in HTLV-1, the LTR cat was much higher, much, uh, has greater activity uh, in, in virus-infected cells. However, by analogy to HTLV, it was expected that this gene was encoded in a three prime region. Uh, uh, and that was not borne out by structural, uh, I mean, by uh, functional analyses. So, what Sasha did is using uh, cDNA clones from infected cells and mapped the activity. And it actually maps to uh, a region immediately before the ENF gene. Uh, which was previously thought to be non-coding because it was pretty short, I guess. Uh, and it was actually uh, um, brings together two different, two, two different exons. Um, I know that um, uh, Andy, following me, is going to give a detailed uh, talk on the mechanism of TAT transactivation, so I won't belabor uh, its, its mechanism. But just to say that uh, not only is the localization of the gene different from HTLV tax, but mechanistically it's also very different because it's not a transcriptional activator like tax. Uh, instead, it functions post-transcriptionally as an anti-terminator. Now, move, the discovery of REV is somewhat serendipitous. Um, Mandy had shown early on that uh, mu uh, mu deletions or mutations in the TAG gene was completely knock out infectivity. Mark Feinberg at the, uh, in the lab then uh, did further mutag mutagenesis studies, and he hit upon two very interesting mutants uh, shown here, M1 and M2. And both of these mutations were made within the TAT gene. But one of, one of the mutant, M1, uh, has greatly reduced TAT uh, function uh, but not completely. Uh, and another uh, mutant, M2, actually has full TAT function, and yet both are completely replication defective. So suggesting that these two mutations may hit a gene that is separate from TAT. 
And if you look at the expression uh, pattern uh, uh, by uh, northern blot, uh, in wild type infected cells, you see three major size distributions. Uh, a genomic size RNA, 9.2 KB, and then multiple band, uh, mul well, diffuse band at 4.3 KB, and an even broader band around 2 KB. Interestingly, the, these two um, uh, mutants uh, show predominantly only the small molecular weight species. So somehow this novel gene and, uh, is affecting the, uh, pr the expression or the, the detection of the, the uh, higher molecular weight RNAs. So when you look at the corresponding uh, uh, cDNA clones, you see a very complex pattern, and this is only a, a partial list of all the uh, possible uh, uh, splice donor receptor utilization. So all of them actually utilizes the same major five prime donor site uh, and the same three prime polyadenylation signal sequence, so that's conserved on both ends, but internally, there are all kinds of different splice receptor donors utilized, but in general, the you know, the, there's the genomic RNA, which uh, can serve as new uh, packaged virus RNA genomes, as well as mRNA for GAC pole expression. It's the 9KB species. Uh, the 4KB uh, species is very heterogeneous, encoding for the envelope and many of the structural proteins. Uh, and this multi the, the small RNA encodes for TAT uh, REF and NEF. And you see that one f interesting feature is that the higher molecular weight species, the 4KB and 9KB, all contain intronic, functional intronic sequences, uh, which is removed in, in, in this 2KB species. And within this um, uh, intron sequence uh, in, in the M region uh, is present an element uh, which responsive to the, the novel gene protein, REF. So I think at this point, a lot of groups join in to analyze the function of REF. Uh, you know, again, of, of course, Joe who, and, and, and Hazeltine, uh, who also discover the, um, the REF genes shortly, I mean, around the same time as, as we, we did. Uh, Brian Cullen's lab, Warner Green's lab, uh, Pavlaka's lab, many, many others. I, I can't possibly name them all. But the picture that emerges is that the REF protein is actually a shuttle protein. It contains a nuclear uh, export sequence, which interacts with export factor, cellular factors, and a, new port, a nuclear localization uh, signal, which interact with uh, nucle uh, imp uh, nuclear import factors. But in this region, there's also a uh, arginine-rich uh, domain, which binds directly to RA. So what you have is that the REF, while in the nucleus, nucleus, can bind to incompletely splice RNA, which contains the RE. Now normally, cellular RNA that contains uh, uh, functional introns will either be retained and com get completely spliced or degraded. They don't get outside to the cytoplasm. But of course, retroviruses have this problem because they do need to, to have the uh, genomic RNA as well as the uh, envelope RNA and, 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 and others, uh, uh, not fully spliced RNA uh, translated in the cytoplasm. So the REF actually overcomes this uh, dilemma by ferrying those high molecular weight species RNA out to the cytoplasm. The REF protein, of course, can recycle back into the nucleus uh, and, uh, and do this all over again. Now, one consequence of REF dependence is that HIV infection is now actually divided into two phases. The in Early after infection, before when there's no lab ref or low ref, uh, only the completely spliced RNA would get out. 
but as RNA, as ref builds up, then you start exporting the ref containing mRNA, and then virus production uh, uh, can happen. Now, it's, it has been uh, it's been proposed that insufficient ref function can also contribute to cellular latency. So, with the current uh, focus on the latent reservoir, I think it may um, re-emphasize the role of REF uh, and TAP for that matter, matter in the uh, maintenance of persistent viral reservoirs. Now, I should also mention that, just for the record, uh, Bob mentioned that the REX gene of HTLV predicts the REF gene of HIV, and that's not true. I mean, it may predict the presence of extra coding sequences, but the function of REF was actually determined, you know, several years, I think a couple of years before that uh, the REX gene was, yeah, REX gene function was, uh, was uh, analyzed. But it still amazes me to, these, to this day that two viruses of such different lineages would evolve uh, almost identical mechanisms for overcoming uh, this uh, uh, nuclear retention problem. Now, you may ask, how do the simple retroviruses do that? Because they don't have a ref, and yet they have the same problem of, you know, exporting genomic and envelope coding RNA. And in that case, it's now known that they have uh, cis-acting elements that constitutively transport uh, the, the, the RNA. So, I think TAT and REV certainly are mechanistically fascinating, and uh, it's, as well as the other accessory proteins. And they've really drawn the curtain on many important cellular processes, including nuclear transport, splicing, um, host, uh, cell, uh, host virus uh, interactions, uh, as in the Apoback story. Uh, and many, many others. But ironically, even though TAT and REF are known to be essential for HIV, they have not been fruitful targets for, gene, uh, for antiviral therapy. Uh, as I think, as you know, the most effective therapy is uh, are all targeted against the viral enzymes so far, and, and they have essentially uh, rendered uh, AIDS into a chronic disease. In, at least in developed countries. So it is not clear that, um, I mean, currently there's really no clear path for strategies to utilize TAT and REF as targets, but uh, maybe in future uh, there will be, especially now with such intense focus on uh, so-called cure research. So from, you know, enough of the history, I would sort of want to look forward uh, to the future. So, as I said, uh, this is a project I'm quite excited about uh, that has something to, uh, related to cure research. Now, and I think there is a general consensus that the uh, major goal for future AIDS research is towards a cure, is working towards a cure. And there are a number of strategies that's been tossed around, and I think it's clear that uh, it has to be multi-pronged. Uh, it's not sufficient to just um, block uh, virus transmission or infection, uh, so, uh, and it's not enough to just reactivate uh, latent viruses because then you reseed the reservoir uh, very efficiently. And ideally, one should also enlist the host immune response to, um, to um, um, kill the, vir uh, the virus-infected cells. So the, the um, molecule I'm going to talk about is uh, developed, is an antibody, uh, a humanized monoclonal antibody against CD4. And it's an a, a antibody developed at uh, UBI, United Biomedical Incorporated, uh, who's, which is uh, headquartered he, uh, here in, we're very close to here in New, uh, Long Island. And the uh, founder of UBI is my uh, friend and long-term long -term collaborator, Dr. Chang Yi Wong. I actually met Chang Yi um, at the International AIDS Conference in Paris in 1985, right? 
So it's a long time ago. I think everything now is in decades, not, not in years. So, um, so I think in, inhibiting virus entry is a very appealing approach because you can stop the virus infection right from the start. And, uh, and there has been a lot of efforts trying to block virus entry. Uh, from the uh, antibody perspective, I think most of the efforts has been on neutralizing antibodies against GP120, either uh, man-made or naturally occurring in patients. Uh, so far, I think some very potent and interesting antibodies have been found, but so far, I think the major problem is that none of them is really 100% broadly active. And as a single agent, they're not able to uh, avoid generating resistance. Now, one can, of course, also target the cellular receptors, but that's no guarantee that you avoid resistance. Uh, there's uh, another CD4 uh, uh, antibody, uh, TMB355, which has been in the clinic, by the way, uh, and induce, I mean, you can see virus rebound, I think, within days after you dose in patients. So, UB421 uh, is a competitive inhibitor, and it's been shown to inhibit 100% uh, of a broad spectrum of either tissue culture or wild, uh, 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 clinical uh, isolates. Uh, this antibody actually has been uh, tested uh, by Taiwo Chen, Chen in uh, uh, Tony Fauci's lab, and he was actually very impressed. He said that's the best uh, antibody he's ever seen. Now, UB421 uh, has clinical proof of concept. Uh, it's gone through preclinical, uh, pre -clinical, but also phase one and, and, and uh, 2A, phase 2A data, and show that, again, there's no virus uh, rebound uh, uh, when dosed in patients. But I'm going to skip all that because of time uh, and go to uh, the latest phase two data results, which I think is uh, really interesting. So this is a heart replacement trial. Um, so essentially, you have heart stabilized patients, uh, which then they uh, dose, start, uh, withdraw heart, and then dose the patients in two cohorts. Uh, one is day, uh, weekly uh, for eight weeks, or biweekly uh, at double the um, at 25 at higher dose for um, uh, uh, 16 weeks, and then they are put back on heart. And this trial was. Uh, carried out at three different sites uh, in Taiwan. So the idea is to look at the patients to see if there's virus rebound, and if there is, how long it takes. So what is very interesting is that um, you see that the patients at the start of the trial had negligible viral, uh, viral RNA expression. And this persisted throughout the duration of uh, treatment with uh, UB421. Uh, and maintain, of course, when you put, put, heart, um, put them back on heart. Now, this is actually has not been seen before as a monotherapy. If you compare to historical data, uh, none of the drugs on the market would give you uh, long, durable virus uh, suppression. Uh, the, uh, this is supposed to be a very potent uh, neutralizing uh, GP120 antibody. Uh, likewise, you get virus rebound very, very early. Uh, Pro-140 is an, a CCR5 antibody, and that's doing much better, you see, but still it doesn't persist uh, uh, beyond uh, for, for, for very long. But uh, UB421, uh, it really persisted uh, with the suppression uh, at least up to the 16 weeks that we, that, that we looked at. So, so, okay, I think um, it's uh, clear that UB41 is a very in effective virus inhibitor. But it seems to do more than that. Uh, it goes beyond that. Uh, the most interesting feature uh, so far is that the treated patients seem to have significant reduction in the T regulatory cells. And this is uh, in, in, in both cohorts. Now, of course, the function of T regulatory cells is still not completely clear, but many studies have linked depletion or downregulation of T reg um, to increase uh, 
immune response, especially viral-specific immune response, uh, as well as uh, immune activation. Um, we were very interested to see one of the abstracts uh, presented at the recent International AIDS Conference in Durban uh, by this group, um, which, you know, they, they use an, an agent that uh, depletes T-Rex cells specifically in this so-called elite controller, rhesus macaques. And what they see, I think instead of reading the whole thing, is that um, the T-Rex depletion actually uh, resulted in both reactivation of latent virus and a boost of CTL response. And indeed, uh, we saw in our own hands features that are consistent with that. Uh, for example, we see increase in CD8 T cell population. And by the way, there's no decrease in CD4, so that removes the, the concern about using an, a CD4 antibody to some degree. Uh, it also increased in antigen, HIV antigen-specific proliferative response of CD8 cells. Now, in terms of the activation of CD4, uh, there was observation that uh, via CD4 uh, cross-linking, there was increase in TNF alpha secretion, and also the examples of uh, activation of HIV expression from uh, latent cells. And I think this particular experiment was again done by uh, Tai Wu. Uh, in Fauci's lab. So finally, there's some indication that maybe there is an, a reduction of uh, HIV <coughs> reservoir as, a, as measured by proviral DNA. So this just shows some of the patients. Uh, in a few patients, of course, the viral DNA burden was already quite low, sometimes beyond the limit of detection. But in, patient, in a few patients that have higher uh, viral DNA, you actually see a reduction of that in the treated patient, uh, which seems to be maintained uh, after you put them back on heart. So I think that's very exciting. Um, so here you have a, an agent that seems to impact an, on all the axes of, uh, of a cure strategy. Uh, it certainly can block receding of the viral reservoir by preventing cell cell as well as cell-free infection. Uh, it may immune reactivate uh, the uh, latent CD4 cell, and then it may increase the CD4 eight, uh, CD8 cell uh, immunity. So whether this uh, antibody, um, and, and also it, it seemed to uh, lead to reduction in the virus reservoir. Now whether this uh, antibody, perhaps in combination with a different regimen, with a heart regimen, for example, will lead to a functional cure uh, remains to be seen. So I think what UB421 is, is that it's an example of the next generation of antivirals uh, that may play a role in our efforts uh, towards a cure. And, and uh, I think a lot of other similar agents may appear, and it would be interesting to see what unfolds in the coming, coming years. Because after all, we're not just interested in the history of HIV, but to borrow a very trite expression, we want to make HIV history. Yeah, I, I didn't. Okay, the comparison of, uh, of the, uh, our antibody with uh, David Hose. Um, I, didn't, I actually have a slide for that, but I didn't show because of time. Uh, his antibody is uh, uh, recognizing a different domain on CD4. It's a non-competitive inhibitor. It doesn't inhibit 100% of all isolates. It's only like 80%. And when he dosed that in patients as a single agent, Within days, you get virus rebound. So it's it's very different. So just to keep us on time, just one more question. Yeah, just wanted to make a point. You, you mentioned surprisingly that there's no inhibitor of TAT flossy. Uh, Valenti. There's it, no. It, you, you know, there wasn't any good approach. Surprisingly, not a good yeah. approach to knock off TAT. Valenti at Yale has a TAT inhibitor, which gives the most remarkable long-term effects I've ever seen. 
okay. and one of the most exciting things in all of HIV therapy research. So that's now Is a little passe. Yeah, it's a it's a specific TAT inhibitor. Uh, multiple papers on it actually. Oh, nice. And they the the shock and kill lately there's well, there's at least some papers arising that actually increases the size of the reservoir. So that's, I think that's because if you don't block. That's yeah, why I said no, no, shock, I, kill, I, kill, and block. Well, yeah. it, maybe. Uh, maybe there's other reasons that it's not so great. Maybe there's also other T cells. Well, being I think activated. it's obvious if you don't prevent yeah. reinfection. No, no, it, it's nothing against this approach. It's nothing against <laughs> yeah. this approach, but long term virus suppression maybe is, uh, is, is a real functional cure if you can make it long term and you don't need therapy. Anymore, which well, is the I'm, direction you're no, going? No, I'll, I'll first go as functional cure, all right? Yeah. But I think I agree with Mark I uh, Harrington. I think we should always set the goal cure. higher. For viral, yeah. Well, it's a, it, it's it's an interesting debate. I think if you can just keep virus suppressed forever more, and you only need a drug once a year or twice a year, you're essentially cured. We live with a lot of organisms, including viruses. The other, other I think, if no, you're going to yeah, talk about eradication, care. prove yeah. it with yeah. pro-virus analysis of every cell of the body after the person is dead, and that's going to take gene therapy. I think. Yes, well, that's our goal. I, I, I